Well, good morning. Welcome to the Ministry of the Word service at Believer's Chapel. It is great to see so many of you here with us this morning. Uh, as you may have noted in the online bulletin, we have increased the capacity up to 120. Uh, in an effort to do that, we do need to be mindful of some of the protocols that we've put in place. So we would ask that you would uh, continue to wear the mask as you're moving about. You certainly don't need to wear it uh, while you sit here and listen, but you can. And then as you leave, uh, please be sure to wear the mask and maintain uh, social distancing. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning. We are getting back on the program with Footsteps of Faith, so that will pick up for the kids on September 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, we will have kindergartners through sixth grade welcome, and the theme this year is Why Did Jesus Come? So the first class will be a welcome back game night and pizza will be provided. Be interested to see where the pizza's coming from. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll come. <laughs> Again, that's September 9th. We do continue to have the need in the nursery as more of us are coming. Uh, that requires more help with the little ones. So if you are able to volunteer, please do reach out to Sarah Terrell and see if you can be of help in the nursery on Sundays. And we have a few prayer requests. Uh, Bev Terrell, Joe and Chuck's mother, has been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, so please uh, be praying for her and for the family, as well as uh, Rachel Freiberger's father, who has pneumonia. So uh, keep him in your prayers as well this week. Well, now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth. And... Good morning to all of you. It, it is good to see things kind of returning to normal and increasingly having more people here on a Sunday morning. Good to have you and hello to all of you out there. Good to have you with us too. We're finishing up our study this morning in 2 Thessalonians. So we began chapter 3 last week. A rather short, chap, uh, short passage, this is much more lengthy, but uh, we're going to look at verses 6 through 18. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, it is a great privilege and pleasure to be with your people on this Lord's Day. What a, 
a blessing it is, and we are so glad to see things opening up a little more, and we're able to have more people here, and we pray that you would bless us in our assembly this morning here, and, and those who are watching on the live feed, we're all together, if not in body, certainly in spirit, and we pray your special ministry to each one of us. We pray that you would bless us, that um, uh, Paul's instruction here, which is a very practical instruction, would uh, be made very clear to us, and the application would uh, be made to us by the Spirit of God. So may we learn to follow the instruction that's here and be witness for, witnesses for you in this world we, we look to you to bless. Uh, Lord, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 14 that you are not a God of confusion. You are a God of order, and you want us to live fruitful and orderly lives. And we learn that from our passage this morning. And so bless us with that. Uh, may we honor you in, in our behavior. The world is watching us. And we are living in dark and confused and disorderly times, rebellious times. May we be witnesses in the things that we do. We pray your blessing upon us in that way. Bless us spiritually. Bless us with a, a, a greater knowledge of you. Bless us with a greater likeness to Christ. Sanctify us, Father. Bless us spiritually, but Father, we pray that you would bless us materially, physically as well. We pray you'd bless those whose health has been compromised. We think of Gwen Phillips. We pray that you would heal her. We pray that you would uh, protect others. We think of uh, Madeline Hargrove, Audrey Harrell, Betty Radford, and Margaret Smith, and there are others, Father, as well, whose, whose names have not been mentioned, but we know all of us have issues, and there are some who have protracted problems, physical problems. We pray your, your blessing upon all. We pray that you keep them safe and healthy. We pray that for the entire congregation. Keep us healthy. We're taught today by the Apostle about work. That's our subject, and we want to work. So we pray, Lord, you'd bless our workers, the workers in this body, those who have jobs, those who provide for themselves and for their families. We pray that you would bless those who own businesses. We pray that you preserve their business, prosper them, bless those men and women who are providing for themselves, who have jobs, and we pray that you'd keep those jobs, preserve those jobs, and there are some who are in between jobs, some are without work at this time, and we pray that you would provide for them and open doors of opportunity. So we pray you'd bless us. Bless our land. Give our leaders wisdom to make the best decisions for our country and and do so in this very critical time in which we live. So we pray that you would provide. Lord, in this time, you can do a great awakening among us, and I pray for that. That's really the great need we have. It's not physical. It's spiritual. Awaken people to the need of the Savior, and may we be lights in that way. So, Lord, all the praise goes to you, our triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we pray now you'd bless us as we uh, sing our next hymn and prepare our hearts for a time of study together. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I am an occasional reader of spy novels. I've mentioned that before, exclusively the books of John Le Carre. One of his characters is the spy master George Smiley. He's an unlikely hero. There's nothing dashing about him. His hobby is collecting old books. He seems more suited for an Oxford lecture hall than the uh, lurid world of espionage. His strength is his mind. 
On one occasion, he spoke of how he would handle an enemy agent that he compared to a rogue elephant charging out of the thicket. He said he would bring it down, but with minimum of force. In other words, with as little collateral damage as possible. I thought of that statement as I was studying our passage because that was Paul's approach to problem solving. It's a wise one. He restored sinners gently with concern and without a heavy hand. We see that in our text and in the counsel he gave for the right way to correct bad behavior. It's a good lesson for us. It's the last lesson in our study of 2 Thessalonians. And so I would summarize the book and Paul's reason for writing it in three ways. He wrote first to comfort the saints in their suffering. Secondly, to correct false teaching that was confusing them. And thirdly, to command the lazy among them to work. That last is our subject, and Paul spilled a lot of ink on it from verses 6 to 15. That's almost as much space as he gave to correcting the false teaching on the day of the Lord back in chapter 2. Now that shows the importance of this subject of work and the deadliness of laziness, idleness. Now we know the importance of that just by reading the Proverbs, which extol industry and rebuke sloth. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise. Proverbs 6, verse 6. And here, Paul gives a a proverb of his own. If anyone would not work, neither should he eat. Now, you might think that seems pretty heavy-handed, depriving people of food. Paul was firm, but he was not unkind, and he was not unreasonable. His purpose was always to restore, and his means were always just. William Bradford, the first governor of the Pilgrim's Colony in Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, used that verse famously, I think, to his great advantage during an early crisis in uh, the settlement. They, They had a bad economic system to begin with. Everything they produced was put in a common store. Everyone got the same amount, whether they worked six days or worked three days. And you can imagine that affected the motivation of those who were working diligently. And the result was production was low. Then some new settlers joined the colony who were lazy, who didn't work at all. And so the governor enforced Paul's rule. If anyone would not work, neither should he eat. And it didn't take long, just a few days, and they started working. He also changed the economy. He, he divided the, the common field among the families to give them ownership. So they owned private property, and they supported themselves. As a result, they worked harder. They produced a surplus. Now, that's basic capitalism. But that's not Paul's lesson here at the end of 2 Thessalonians. He had a a higher motive for his work ethic than profit. It It was adorning the doctrine. It was glorifying God in one's behavior. He begins by telling the earnest Christian in the church to withdraw from the idle believer. Here they they are called those who live or who lead an unruly life. Maybe a number of them, there may be one of them, but they're described as leading an unruly life. But the word unruly really means idle or lazy. I think this is the only place where this word is used. And the context makes it clear. These are idle people. These are lazy people. Another possible translation of this verse is stand aloof from them. And the point or the purpose of the instruction is to give these people who are in error in their behavior, give them no support in their error. 
Because what they were doing is very serious. It, it is a moral failure. I would say, as I think about this, that for the Apostle Paul, doctrinal error always had first priority in correction. Now, that's probably true to say of all the apostles. Doctrinal error is of first importance because it was spiritually deadly. And it always affects behavior. It affects it in a negative way. As he thinks, so he is. Proverbs 23, verse 7. The way a person thinks affects the way he or she behaves. And that goes back to the importance of doctrine. In fact, many commentators see this problem of not working as due to their belief in that error that Paul corrected in chapter 2 about the day of the Lord. And they're thinking, well, why work? Uh, this the day of the Lord, and the Lord's coming soon. Uh, the second coming was about to arrive. It's near. There's no point in working. And that's possible. That's a possible interpretation. But the fact is, laziness is always a potential problem. Work is hard. Work is good. It's a blessing. We were created to work. In fact, in the garden, Adam his work was really considered worship. And we worship God in the way we work. But after he fell, things changed. The ground was cursed. It promised to bear thorns and thistles so that he would eat his bread only in the sweat of his face. And so it is for mankind. All work takes effort. It's hard. So everyone is tempted to take the easy path, some less than others. Some are self-starters, some are just diligent, some are workaholics, some may swing to the other side. But everyone, to some extent, is tempted to take the easy path. But however we see the, this problem here in Thessalonica, there is always the temptation to cut corners, to slack off. Paul treated this as very important. Moral error for him was deadly, like doctrinal error is. And here he deals with it firmly. He told them to keep away from those people, stand aloof. Now, he didn't cut them off completely from fellowship. Uh, his, he considered them believers. In verse 15, he says that these people... Uh, are to be treated as believers. He considered them believers. He says they are not an enemy. And so they were to admonish these people, or admonish, he says, admonish him as a brother, maybe with a particular person in mind. But in order to do that, they had to have some social contact with this individual or these individuals. But they were not to engage in close fellowship. They were to impress on him or on these offenders, these idlers, the seriousness of their error. Paul had given them instruction before. He refers to it here as the tradition which you receive from us. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he gave instruction on work. So this evidently was an ongoing problem. But in addition to this instruction, Paul also set an example. And in the next verses, he reminds them of his conduct and how he and his friends lived when they were among them in Thessalonica. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. That means they were not idle when they were there. Their conduct was not lazy. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden uh, to any of you. <clears throat> Very likely, they uh, stayed in the home of Jason, and we, we can gather that from the circumstances of that first 
visit to Thessalonica that's recorded in Acts 17 and, and verse 5. Because after Paul left the synagogue with some Jews and Gentiles who had believed after they were really driven out of the synagogue, they, those at the synagogue and some others that they gathered from the city square attacked Jason's house where people were staying. So evidently, they thought Paul was there, and Silas and Timothy were guests, probably because he was there, and he had been there. So the, the Thessalonians knew all of that. They knew Paul's life and that of Silas and Timothy, how they behaved among them while he was staying there with Jason, and how Paul and the others conducted themselves. They didn't accept any free hospitality. They paid for everything. They paid for their rent. They paid for their food. It, it would not have been wrong to have accepted hospitality. In fact, Jesus taught the worker is worthy of his support, Matthew 10, verse 10. And Paul knew that. He says it in verse 8. In fact, he accepted a gift from the Philippians while he was there in Thessalonica. He refers to that in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 16. So Paul was not against taking uh, help or assistance, but things were different in Thessalonica. He did not want to give any impression that he was there for personal gain. He wasn't trading on the gospel. And he didn't want to be a burden to any of them. Remember, you know the, we know this from, first, from 2 Corinthians, that these were poor saints. These churches in Macedonia and northern Greece were very poor, and he was very mindful of that. But he wanted to impress upon them this great truth, and that is the gospel is free. There are no strings attached. And to give that message very clearly... Paul and the others worked, and they worked night and day to support themselves. It was a model for them, for these Thessalonians. That's what Paul said, a model of the gospel, that grace is free, and a model for them for the Thessalonians' behavior. It is good to work and not be a burden on others. So Paul's instruction has the weight or authority of a consistent example behind it. He practiced what he preached. He and the others worked hard night and day. Again, they had seen this problem of indolence before when they were there. Paul says in verse 10, that's when they had laid down the rule, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Uh, there's been some speculation on this statement that he makes here in, in verse 10. Is, it has the sense of a proverb about it, and so some have wondered, did Paul... Uh, invent this statement? Is it his proverb or did he get it from someplace else? And it seems from the study that's been given on that, that this is the oldest version of it. So it seems that it was Paul's expression. He coined this proverb, but still the, the principle behind it is found in other places, such as Proverbs 16, verse 26. A worker's appetite works for him, for his hunger urges him on. God created us with an, an innate mechanism to move us to work. And that's our appetite, salvation. So here Paul was saying, well, let, we'll let that work. We'll let that principle work. We'll let hunger have its way. Their appetite will guide them to the right behavior. But on a, uh, the moral side of it, it is right to work. It's wrong to live off other people's hard labor. Labor, Idleness should not be rewarded. It's not healthy. It's not healthy psychologically for the person who doesn't work. It doesn't elevate a person. It doesn't ennoble a person. In fact, it causes a person to become dependent. And 
that it is not proper in and of itself for the person. But Paul's real point here is it's wrong to do that. Don't support them in bad behavior is what he's instructing the Thessalonians here. That's Paul's main meaning here. It is a moral issue. And bad behavior not only is, is bad in and of itself, but it, it, of course, breeds other bad behavior, further bad behavior. Paul gives an example of that in verse, uh, verse 11 to support the action he has directed them to take. Idlers become meddlers. Verse 11, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now, not, they were not doing that because of external circumstances, such as um, health issues or persecution. These were internal reasons, bad choices. Sometimes people can't work for legitimate reasons. And that wasn't the case here. This is laziness. We, we are not made to be inactive. So if people don't have work to fill their time, then they, they will fill it with something else. And the idol in the Thessalonian church had become busybodies. They become uh, meddlers. Paul used a play on words to make his point in the Greek text, and it doesn't really translate over into the English text, but uh, some have tried to produce this, uh, this play on words with the translation that they had, they had become busybodies instead of being busy. What made this essentially problematic is, as Paul indicated in verse 10, they had given instruction on work and laziness earlier when they were there in Thessalonica on that second missionary journey, and still the problem continued. These people weren't responding to Paul's instruction. The problem, the problem had only gotten worse. People were filling their time with useful and harmful activity, interfering in people's lives gossiping. So due to their disobedience, Paul had to take this stern action against them. Given in verse 6, keep away from the brother who leads a lazy life, stand aloof from him. But, but he also gave some positive instruction for the idlers, some positive direction. He gives that next in verse 12. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. This, this command and exhortation is in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning it was given in the full authority of Christ. So this is not just Paul the man giving instruction, but the Lord's instruction. But it's not new. It is essentially the, the instruction that he gave back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. And there he told them, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. So he commanded them that when they were there. Then he wrote the first epistle because this was still a problem. And that's the instruction that he reminded them that he gave and here he's doing it again. Now, now that itself suggests to me that this was not the response uh, of these Thessalonians to the false teaching about the day of the Lord. It was already a problem before that confusion occurred, maybe before they even heard the gospel. More likely, this was a kind of cultural problem. They were Greeks, and Greeks believed that that labor was degrading. Manual labor, working with their hands, was beneath a Greek to work in that way. Paul corrected that in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Labor is not beneath them. Labor is noble. Adam worked with his hands in the garden. That was established before the fall. 
And while we are able, we are to engage in it. While we have the ability, while we have the opportunity, we are to do it. We are to engage in work. That's essential to the Christian life. In fact, in my mind, this is the basic Christian life. We think of being a an obedient Christian, a bold Christian. We think of that in terms of giving the gospel, witnessing, and traveling to foreign lands maybe, this kind of thing. And of course that is. That's, that's sacrificial and it's bold and it's good and we need to be men and women who exhibit the gospel. But this is really the basic Christian life summed up in these two simple verses. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, work with your hands. That's an orderly life. Be faithful in the basics, in the fundamental things. Lead a quiet life. Here Paul says, work in quiet fashion. Don't get involved in other people's business. I heard some good advice once, not all that long ago. I don't remember who gave it to me, but the advice is don't give advice unless you're asked. Now, sometimes we need to do that. We have to intervene. Paul was doing that here. They didn't ask him for advice. He's giving what they needed to know. But generally, I think that's a good rule. But a quiet life is more than silence. It is a tranquil life, the, the opposite of a restless life. It's also an active life and an orderly life, a life that is involved that involves the home life and the work life, family life and business life. That's what Paul is speaking of in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. He urged the Thessalonians to attend to their own business and work with their hands, be productive, be a good neighbor, be a friend, and support their family. Don't be dependent on others to do that. That's our first responsibility. And take care of others. I, you could, as a corollary to this, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, where Paul tells those who were thieves to steal no longer, but labor, work with your hands, so you can provide for yourself, but you'll have something to help others with who are in need. So we're to help others. People are in need and we need to assist them. But this is a different problem that Paul is dealing with here. He's telling them to be responsible individuals with their own personal lives. So we live responsibly. Within the home, we're to be faithful to one another husbands and wives to each other. Fidelity is fundamental to a good home, to the proper home life that Paul is describing here. It's fundamental to godliness, fidelity, faithfulness. We need to speak the gospel. As I mentioned, be missionaries, be evangelists, wherever we are, give the gospel, speak it when we have the opportunity. But listen, our words will fall on deaf ears if our life is disorderly and not consistent with the grace of God, not consistent with the very message we preach. And so after giving that advice to the indolent among them, Paul tells the rest of the congregation in verse 13 to continue doing good. In other words, don't be influenced by the lazy. That, it seems was a big part of the problem for the pilgrims at Plymouth. Those who, who didn't work hard received as much as those who worked hard, so the diligent, as I, I mentioned earlier, began to slack off. Paul here was saying, don't be influenced like that. Don't be influenced by the lazy. Follow our example, not the example of those lazy people. Continue to do good, meaning continue to work hard to the glory of God. God, on, God honors that. People who are disobedient in, in any number of ways can have an adverse effect on others. It, 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 disobedience is contagious. So Paul's counsel to the vigilant was resist, persevere, do not grow weary in doing good. His counsel 
is clear and strong, but again, as we've seen, there was some history with this problem. Paul gave this instruction before without compliance from these idle Christians. So anticipating that some might not obey, he reinforces his instruction on how they were to be treated. And while he is firm, it's worth noting how, as Leon Morris said, he kept a brotherly tone. We see that here in verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Paul was not eager, eager to punish people or exile them. In fact, just the opposite. His goal was to restore the wayward, to win back and, and put that person or those people on the right path, the righteous path. Again, they were to be firm. They were to withdraw fellowship, to make their shame, that is the shame of these lazy individuals, clear to them. It was punishment, it was discipline, but the, the person was still regarded as a brother. This person or persons had ignored Paul's instruction in the, the first letter. He was uh, stubborn. Still, verse 15 shows warmth and concern for him on the part of the apostle. He, he was guided by a spirit of love in the way he de dealt with these individuals. Paul even defends this person or these people. He states that he's not an enemy. Here's the reality. Believers go astray. Human nature is weak. We've not, we're not at that place of perfection yet. We are being sanctified and the Lord is changing us. And ideally, we are on a, a, a progressive road upward, and we are developing and becoming increasingly like Christ, but we are still weighed down with sin, the sin that's in us. It's what Paul speaks of in Romans 7 and, and Galatians 5. Sin is enticing, but it is also a web, and one that's hard to extract ourselves from. Easy to become entangled in it because it's so enticing, but very difficult to get out of. So the wayward need help, but help that avoids a lot of collateral damage. Christians can be critical. Christians can be severe. Paul didn't want this individual or these individuals so wounded by the church that it would have been hard for him or them or her to rejoin the fellowship. So to reconcile him with the best result, he counseled these believers, these Christians in Thessalonica, to treat him with the best motives from love and with minimum of force. This is serious business, correcting the sinner. It takes wisdom to do this properly. And <clears throat> It takes love and it takes concern. And that means it takes a lot of prayer and a lot of thought. It takes maturity to do that. And Paul guided the thinking of the church here by reminding them that the offender is not an enemy, but one of the family, a brother. That means he or she was one for whom Christ died. So help him. What all of this tells us is <clears throat> there was evidently a division within the church, not only with those who uh, here in chapter 3 wouldn't work, but those in chapter 2 who were confused about doctrine. So Paul ends his letter in a way that, uh, with a prayer that he offers to them. And this is typical of Paul's 
letters, but uh, certainly ha he had their situation in mind when he gives this prayer in verse 16. Now, may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. Christ is the Lord of peace. He desires peace in his family. Not peace at the expense of truth. Truth is paramount. Without it, we lose the gospel. And when we lose the gospel, we lose everything. We must be very precise in our understanding of the truth and rightly divide it. We need to battle for the truth. But he desires harmony in the church. And peace is more than simply the absence of hostility. It's also prosperity. That has, it has that positive aspect to it. And he wants his people to have that prosperity, spiritual prosperity, growing in grace and knowledge, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the triune God. They had to look to him. That's what they need to do. And Paul reminds the Thessalonians of the great promise that Christ gave to his disciples when he prayed, the Lord be with you. And that's the promise that the Lord gave more than once, but gave at the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, verse 20, is that He is always with His people, and He will never forsake us to the end of the age. So they had every reason to seek correction and expect peace through obedience to the Lord. Now, he ends the letter with his autograph, which is what authenticates this letter as genuine. That's what he says, verse 17. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Paul typically dictated his letters. That was typically done in antiquity. The book of Romans, for example, was written down by Tertius. Maybe Silas was his amanuensis here, his secretary. But toward the end, he would typically take, take the pen in hand and he would write the last few verses himself. For example, he wrote a number of verses at the end of Galatians. In Galatians 6, verse 11, he wrote, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. And literally that, that is more, see with what large letters I wrote to you with my own hand. And some feel, he's not referring to the last verses, but the entire letter of the book of Galatians, and he wrote with large letters. And that may be, but typically he would write the last few verses, and apparently the, the lar he wrote with large, sprawling letters, and that was uh, the unmistakable style of the apostle. He calls it a distinguishing mark in every letter. His reason for saying that and pointing that out to them probably goes back to chapter 2, verse 2, where he made reference to a message or a letter as if from us, but it wasn't. It was a forgery, and it had disturbed the people with false teaching. Because everything in that letter had contradicted everything that Paul had taught to them. It was false. And so he's making the point here that he has this distinguishing mark, that this is his personal signature, as it were, with this evidently peculiar, distinctive style of his handwriting. And it showed that this letter, this letter that we've been studying, 2 Thessalonians, is genuine and authoritative. Well, Paul ends his letter... The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I think the all at the end of the verse includes those brothers and sisters who were in error and disobedient, and it shows his concern and affection for the whole flock of God there in Thessalonica. That was a typical conclusion to Paul's letters, but not a mere formality. It expressed his desire and prayer that the Lord continue to supply them with grace. There would be no reconciliation and peace apart from the grace of God. That was true then. It is true now. 
we constantly live on God's grace for our relationship with Him and our relationships with one another. Marriages cannot survive apart from the sovereign grace of God. Children will not grow up to be faithful servants of the Lord apart from the sovereign grace of God. And churches cannot survive in this world apart from grace. We are always under attack whether we realize it or not. That's the reality. We're under attack from the evil one. We live in a, 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 we live in a very material world and we're impressed with that from the world that that's what this world is. It's simply material. But the, the apostles make it clear. Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians 6. We live in a very spiritual world. There's a spiritual dimension that we do not see and we are always under attack from it. And so we need the grace of God. Well, Paul knew this very well. He knew about the condition of the church very well. He knew about the, the attack that the church was on, under constantly. And we, we, we learn about his concern from this, from 2 Corinthians 11, where he gives a list of the trials and the difficulties that he as an apostle had suffered. And in a long list of labors and hardships, he wrote of the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Paul was painfully aware of the constant dangers the church and the Christian faced at all times. Who is led into sin, he said, without my intense concern? Would that we had that kind of concern for this church and for other churches and for one another. Intense concern. That was Paul. He loved the church. He prayed daily for the churches. And this final prayer is an example of that. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And he meant it. It reminds us we are never in such a safe place that we don't need to look to the Lord and seek his help. We are always in a time of need and must look to him alone for grace and peace. And by his grace... He will use us to help each other if we or if one of us should ever drift off into error. And if that is the case, may we be a help, as Paul counseled here, with the, the spirit of love to reconcile and restore a wayward brother or sister. But to do that, to be a church at peace and be a person at peace, we must be a church and a Christian in subjection to the Word of God. That means thinking according to the teaching of the apostles to avoid doctrinal error and uh, living according to the, the morality of the Bible. Here, that is, the, that is stated in this one principle, work in a quiet fashion. But we can multiply the different types of commands and instructions of, uh, that, that are given to us. Here, it's work. Be diligent in that. Our church and we individually will only prosper in God's eyes to the degree that we know and obey Scripture. Because as John Stott rightly wrote, to despise the word of the Lord is to despise the Lord of the word. May God give us obedience to his word and give us peace, the peace that always follows that obedience. If you're here without Christ, if you've not believed in him as the Son of God and Savior of the world, then you have no peace. There's no peace for the wicked, says the Lord God. That's what Isaiah wrote. Well, if you think you do have peace, consider what John wrote at the end of the third chapter of his gospel, he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's not the wrath of God will fall on him, but presently, at this moment, right now, the wrath of God abides on him. Flee the wrath. Come to Christ. Believe in him. May God help you to do that. And you who have, I hope it's everybody here. 
rejoice in what you have in Christ and live in every aspect of your life. May we all do that to His glory. Let's bow in a word of prayer and thank the Lord for what He's given us. And then I'm going to give at the same time thanks for the Lord's Supper and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness and Your grace to us. And what a blessing it is to work. That's such a large part of the subject that Paul dealt with at the end of this book. And I pray that you would give us joy in it and, and, and be thankful for the work that we have. And we do pray for those that are presently without work. We pray that you would bless them with, with diligence in seeking employment, but you open doors for them. It's a daunting task. Give us all the desire to live to your glory every day in everything that we do and to work diligently and give people opportunity to do that. We thank you for the life you've given us in your son. We turn our thoughts now to the Lord's table and we pray that you would prepare our hearts to take these elements, remembering Jesus Christ and what he did for us, remembering our triune God and what God has done for us, Father. What you did in choosing your people and sending your Son to die for us and the willingness of Christ to come for us and the Spirit who draws us by His great power to faith and obedience. It's a work of the Trinity. Bless us now, Lord. Prepare our hearts. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, there is the story of Zacchaeus encounter with the Lord Jesus. Almost everyone is familiar with that wonderful little scene in which a short in stature and despised tax collector heard that Jesus was passing through Jericho and he went searching for a good spot to view him. We sang about that, or we do sing about it when we're children. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed into the sycamore tree to see what he could see. See, you can still remember that song when you get old. Well, Luke gives us a slightly more sophisticated version of the story. Zacchaeus did climb into a sycamore tree in order to catch a view of the passing Jesus, but it was the Lord who came to the place where he was and stopped and looked up at him. And he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today. I must stay at your house. And you know the rest of the story uh, Zacchaeus came down and brought Jesus into his home and confessed uh, all of his previous sins with the promise to repent and live a new and better life. He apparently, and I say apparently because Luke doesn't say it precisely, but apparently Zacchaeus placed his faith in the Lord and trusted in him for the forgiveness he so desperately desired. And G Jesus then uttered those memorable words, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now that verse has been called the key verse in the gospel of Luke, for it states in a few words the mission of the second person of the triune God when he came to earth. He came to seek and to save uh, that which was lost. And we're here this morning uh, because of that. The Lord sought us out too. Uh, just like Zacchaeus, uh, we in the act of believing uh, get the idea that we're the ones going to look for him and we found him, but the reality is he sought each and every one of us out. So we now have the opportunity to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished in order to obtain his purpose. The bread and the wine and the Lord's Supper uh, are symbols of that. The bread uh, standing or representing his real human body, which he offered up as 
to death as a sacrifice for sin, and the cup with wine uh, standing for the blood he shed to make atonement for sin. If you're here this morning and you have, like Zacchaeus, uh, trusted in Christ for forgiveness and salvation, then we invite you to participate with us now as we observe the Lord's Supper. Not frivolously, uh, but solemnly remembering as you partake of the elements the glory of a God who saves and who sent his Son uh, to be our own dying and now risen Savior. As we partake of the bread, we remember that Jesus took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we do uh, give you thanks for this uh, simple uh, particle of unleavened bread that we will take in our hands and then ex accept by eating it. And in doing so, exercise our obedience to your command. And Lord, give us grace. We've just heard about grace. We need your grace to do this in a worthy manner as we partake, to remember what the bread represents, that it represents your faithful obedience and saving love for us to offer yourself in death on our behalf so that we might have life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark emphasized that the Lord came to seek and save that which is lost. And <clears throat> it is all the sovereign grace of God that saves. You may have in your life at a point of crisis sought resolution to the guilt you felt, to the sin you were bearing. And you came to Christ and you sought him out. But the only reason is because he had come first to seek you out and to obtain you. Well, in light of that, we see that same sense of the sovereign grace of God in John chapter 12. The cross is near. Christ senses it. He knows that the hour is near. And so we read in John 12, verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die. Christ knew what was going to happen. He came to be lifted up on the cross. And the cross here is seen to be like a great magnet spiritually. It is, has power in itself. It draws people to salvation because it paid for their sins and it is effective. And so when we come to this holy table, we're reminded of that. We didn't save ourselves. We didn't seek him out of ourselves. We didn't come to the cross in faith in and of ourselves. It's all a work of the sovereign grace of God because at the cross, He paid for the sins of His people. He saved them at the cross and their coming to Him was as inevitable as a piece of metal being attracted by a magnet. That's the grace of God. And so that's why we celebrate this. This represents that which saved us and gave us new life. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank You for this cup that speaks of the blood of Christ that purchased us for you, that bought us out of the slavery to sin that we were all in, that bought us out from under the wrath of God that abides on every unbeliever, that brought us to you. Thank you for the sacrifice you sent your son to make for us and that he so willingly came to make. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who drew us through the cross to salvation. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, once again, as 
wonderful to be with all of you this morning, and I hope the Lord gives all of us a good week, and we're able to come back again next week. Let's close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Keep looking to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith. See you next week.